Okay, we're uh, we're recording. Um, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to actually our first idea community talk of the fall 2020 uh, semester. Um, we're happy to have Karin Bono talking through um, some work that he did in one of his courses this spring. Um, and he'll explain much more of that as he goes through the context for the work. Um, just a reminder, logistics, that we are recording this. Uh, we will post this video to the talks section of the IDEA website, idea.rpi.edu, uh, after it becomes available. Uh, you can ask questions via the, the uh, chat, and we'll try to uh, pay attention to that, or if it's, um, if it's, if it makes sense, you could speak up and ask uh, Karin the question uh, during the talk. And so without further ado, uh, thank you, Karin. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Karin Panot, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Computer Science. And today I'll basically talk about a project called the Dengue Spread Information System. So a little bit of context of this project. Um, this project was done as part of the X informatics course uh, in the spring 2020. And uh, I'm really glad for the team that I had when I was doing this project because that is the time when everything became very uncertain. We moved online and it was really hard and tough for all of us to you know, get out there, do WebEx meetings, talk on Slack, use other mediums to communicate and get this thing together. We were not only able to, you know, pull this project through in a small time, such as a semester, but we were able to create a publication quality uh, paper out of this. And uh, I'm happy to report that it was recently published. So with that out of the way, let's start with this uh, presentation. So, um, uh, uh, so a background of how we chose to do a project on Dengue, right? So a vector borne disease is basically a disease that is spread through vectors. Now vectors are uh, mosquitoes, ticks, et cetera, which can carry pathogens like virus carrying pathogens from one human to the other human or, act, or the other way that they can uh, communicate, uh, take the pathogen from an animal to a human. Now it's important to study these vector borne diseases because these amount to over 17% of the total infectious disease that are present around the globe today. Now, this amounts to over 400,000 deaths annually, and that's a very, very huge number. So there are several different uh, vector borne diseases like malaria, Zika, Dengue, and we decided like we'll stick with Dengue because uh, one of my team members was familiar with it, and we liked the idea of discussing more about Dengue. So Dengue is also another vector borne disease, which is spread through the Aedes mosquito. And it is preventable, but is still the leading cause of death in several regions. We can find this in the subtropical and the tropical regions around the Southern American as well as the Asian continents. And that's why we were intrigued by this disease because it is preventable, but it's still the leading cause of death. And in the last 50 years, it has actually increased 30 fold, which is very surprising to see. So we uh, jot down and we saw that dengue is actually affected by, you know, several risk factors. A risk factor is basically a certain characteristic which makes you more likely to get acquainted with the disease. For example, for dengue, we have uh, temperature, we have rainfall, and literature has shown that presence of these certain risk factors, a certain proportion of them can actually lead to a likely more cause of dengue. Now, dengue has had many outbreaks in the past. Some of them were uh, in the uh, in the very uh, in the 90s, and the recent one was from the year 2000 to 2010, where we saw like over 1.7 million new cases that were reported in dengue, and out of them, 50,000 cases were very severe cases. So our team decided like, hey, let's take dengue as a uh, as a starting point and see what we can build on this. So we started looking for data and we started looking for information systems, and we found that. It is there is very limited information available outside where you can go and see, hey, this city has the dengue data or that country has dengue data, but there is no information for the risk factors or anything else. So we we decided like, hey, let's 
start and create a geoinformatics systems that will be easy to use and free to access to everyone considering a starting point of a few cities and then we can expand on it as time progresses and as governments and policymakers realize the importance of understanding dengue spread so we decided to create a geoinformatics systems which visualizes the historic spread of dengue in two different cities and provides research plots and data for any future research now this project in the in the very beginning and the later the paper was aimed to facilitate both researchers and policy makers the idea here is to create an information system so that the individuals have access to data as well as some insights of what the data looks like so that they can start by identifying some correlation that can exist between dengue and these risk factors and if a correlation is identified they can start building early warning systems so we can have models that can tell us a particular city is having the certain cr uh, criteria that it can lead to a dengue spread and this will enable policy makers to start developing policies that can target those specific areas and we can curb dengue spread someday in the future so that's the background of how we decided to work on a dengue spread system and now let's see how the application actually looks the information and the data is taken from two different sources initially we wanted to we started with uh, getting the precipitation essentially the rainfall data from nasa but we later figure out that the national oceanic and atmospheric administration already has a lot of information about the two cities that we were exploring and we decided to take the temperature the precipitation and the population data from that resource and next we decided to take the dengue data from the centers of disease control that is the cdc now something to note here is that the data from the two sources was very varied in the time that they use for example the precipitation and the temperature data was taken daily while the dengue cases were recorded on a weekly basis so all in all we had to find a way so that we remove all out all the outliers remove all the bad data and con combine them together and we finalized that we'll always have data in form of months so you can have say january 2020 uh, 2010 and what was the status on that what was the precipitation what was the uh, temperature values and what were the number of dengue cases and so on and so forth so once our data was cleaned and everything was formulated into a single uh, uh, repository and a data file we created the dengue spread information system which visualizes the spread of dengue across two cities as i mentioned before one of them is Iquitos, Peru, and the other is San Juan in Puerto Rico from the year 2000 to 2013. We also, apart from the year 2000, we also included some data from the year 1990 to 2000 as much as we could, but the complete data is available for this duration itself. And then we started, decided to visualize and compare the various risk factors for the two cities so that it provides a stepping stone for researchers to see that some in, so there is some kind of correlation and then they can build from there as we can see in figure number one it shows how the dengue spread looks for january 2008 and it shows the uh, highlighted area having a certain number of dengue cases so the workflow was uh, very simple in our case we took data from noa which is the noaa and the cdc and we combined them together into a specific common data set so we used two dataset files. One was for Equitos, and the other one was San Juan. And in parallel, we uh, we were uh, team members, so we split the work amongst ourselves. And some of us started doing the analysis, where we used Python and Jupyter notebooks to uh, write detailed steps of everything that we thought we should do, and created plots using Matplotlib and compiled them together into reproducible Jupyter notebooks. And on the other hand, we used uh, we started with the website development. We used Flask as well as the Folium library to create an architecture, which was then combined with the analysis to create a whole dengue spread information system. And once the system was complete, we were able to generate reports from it as well as write the paper that recently got published. Uh, so for the application that we developed, uh, we used Python 3. Uh, Python 2 is uh, by that when we were creating the application was no longer supported by the developers. So we stuck with Python 3. We used specific virtual environments and we used a package called pip env. So basically the idea is that if anyone 
wants to replicate the exact same results, exact same application, we provide the baseline structure. So you can just use the same requirements file and you will get the exact same results, plots and everything like we intended it to be. We use Flask as a server because it is easy to set up and it enabled us to deviate more time towards generating plots as well as to uh, designing the architecture and not uh, spending more time on creating a more robust server. Something that we wanted to do, uh, but uh, we ha have it as a future scope. Uh, we compiled all our application code, including the data, including the detailed Jupyter notebooks, including the application code into the GitHub repository, which you can access. Uh, I'll provide a link at the end of this slide. And for visualizing uh, the data, we used Folium, GeoJSON, and Matplotlib. Folium and GeoJSON were used for creating the uh, interactive visualizations that we see in this application. And Matplotlib was used to create the uh, correlation values as well as the plots for the risk uh, factors. So uh, when you open the application for the first time, you are greeted with this page, as you can see in figure number three. Uh, it's, it gives you the title and it gives you uh, two options. The first is you can select a month ranging from January to December. And the next is uh, you can select the year ranging from 1990 to 2013. Once you click on a button submit, uh, the map at the bottom reloads itself. And as you can see, we are, sh we are showing two markers. The below markers is for Peru and the above marker is for San Juan. Uh, the markers are colored blue because the information is available, but there might be a case, as I mentioned earlier, that the information might be missing. So, for example, uh, in figure four, uh, we can zoom into this map. These are interactive maps. We zoom into San Juan for the uh, for January 2008, and we can see that the marker is blue, indicating we have more additional information. We see that the about uh, outline of the city is marked with yellow, and the colors are defined based on the color bar and that we can see at the top. Now, based on the color bar, we can see that the number of dengue cases are on the lower side in comparison to the whole collection of data that we have. When we take a look at the figure number five, it shows that the San Juan uh, for the uh, time January 1990, and we see that marker is gray and so is the region, indicating that we do not have additional information. Now, what do we mean by additional information? We mean that when we click on this particular marker, if it is blue, we will display additional information like the surface temperature, the air temperature, population, estimated population at that time, precipitation, and much more. Now, we made sure that there are layers into the system. For example, uh, as you can see, there's a layers icon. You can remove the basic uh, geo, geo layer uh, from the bottom. You can remove the dengue layer, uh, but the marker always gives you the right information if it is available. And we ensured that uh, the system should not break. So if marker is gray and the user tries to click on it, uh, our system understands it. It shows a blank pop-up and does not crash. So that's the first aspect of what the whole system was intended to be. It provides a basic uh, interactive visualization where any individual can go ahead and see what the two cities look like, what were the st status of the two cities at a given month across a given year. The second part is where we discuss about the risk factors. The risk factors are, as I mentioned, are essential because these are the starting points which can tell us, can we really predict dengue spread if it happens in the future? So that's why we wanted to create a certain number of plots, which will create uh, act as a stepping stone for any early warning system that can start from here. So the first thing is we look at the number of dengue cases reported from July 2000 to April 2013. The color red indicates uh, equitos, and the color uh, blue indicates uh, 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 San Juan. Uh, as we can see, the date range is again 2000 to 2010 and beyond. This is where we were expected to see the highest number of uh, recently increased dengue cases. And as we can see, uh, even the red uh, the red line has some high, uh, spikes near about the year 2004, then around 2007 and 8, 9 and 10, and so on and so forth. Similarly, for San Juan, we also see some spikes. We see one in the year 2001 and majorly in the year nine, 2009 to 2010. And uh, from the scale, we can clearly see that the number of cases in San Juan were exceptionally larger as compared to Equitos. 
but this could be attributed to the fact as we'll see later that they have much higher population their uh, uh, their environmental conditions are much different from the uh, equitos which could be the reason behind this uh, uh, different number of dengue cases so the first uh, idea was to create a, a correlation matrix and color them based on how uh, high the correlation exists we are particularly interested in this uh, last column and I've highlighted the key elements that we can uh, see or identify from this. The first is the population. We see that uh, the population uh, dengue spread is actually related to the population in a given city. It's easy to see why that may, may be a case. For example, uh, if we have a city which has a very large population, if a dengue spread starts, it's easy for the mosquito to take pathogens from one uh, uh, to spread to a large population because there are so many people in that given area. So a correlation value of 0.13 indicates this. Now, next we take a look at the temperature values. Uh, T max implies uh, temperature maximum, minimum, and the average values. We see that it's more correlated with the average value and the minimum value and not the uh, maximum value, indicating certain kind of temperatures that allow for the uh, Aedes mosquito to breed more and leading to more chances of dengue spread. We see a correlation value of 0.25 and 0.22. Now, uh, when we take a look at the precipitation values, the PRCP represents precipitation value. Minus one indicates that the, we are looking at the precipitation value from the last month. Minus two indicate, indicates that the precipitation value was from the month before that. And PRCP simply implies the precipitation value from this year, from this uh, month. So when we look at the three values, we can cl uh, clearly see that the highest value is 0.12, which is related to the pre uh, precipitation from the last month. Now, this is essential and it reveals a very important point that the dengue spread in a given month is not only correlated with the present month's precipitation, but what happened behind, what happened in the last month. Because once a uh, when rainfall happens, it creates a breeding ground, the breeding of the mosquito starts, and it takes a certain amount of time before the dengue spread can start. And as a result, Whenever someone is making uh, an early warning system or creating a similar application, they must keep in mind that the temporal effect is always there when we are looking at dengue spread. Lastly, another uh, essential uh, uh, factor to look at is the highest correlation occurs with humidity. So humidity is uh, defines how uh, how well the uh, temp uh, the the uh, environmental conditions satisfy for the particular mosquito to uh, breed uh, in this particular environment. So we identified that these four are the key uh, well, uh, key uh, risk factors that we need to take into account. Something to note is that there is not a single specific, uh, uh, I would say, characteristic that can decide completely with a value of 0 0.6 or 7 linearly that, hey, if I am true, this means that dengue spread is going to happen. But uh, if we look at them together, we see that a whole bunch of them can actually enable us to draw certain conclusions in the future. So, so um, if I could just um, ask a quick question here on this. Um, so uh, correlating with a, like a previous month's precipitation makes total sense um, yeah, yeah. because there's a lag. But wouldn't the same apply to the humidity? What well, um, wouldn't you? Because, as you said, the humidity has to do with the breeding as well. Yeah. Um, so why wouldn't you be looking at um say the humidity and um humidity minus one humidity minus two as well as precipitation uh so based on what we read in the literature we were sure about the precipitation value having a uh, you know temporal effect uh but uh I, I as far as i recall i didn't read something about humidity in specific but that's an interesting thing that uh you know we can explore uh, I'm not sure if humidity would have the same effect. It likely should, but uh, uh, I, I, as far as I recall, we did not uh, try that out. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. regardless, you, with the humidity that you did use, it had a high correlation. So, yeah. Yeah. all right. Karn okay. continues. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we looked at these factors and see how uh, they compare to one another. So, as you can see, uh, okay, the uh, the the top plot at the top would already always represent the data for Equitos Peru, while the plot at the bottom will always look at San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
So as you can see that the population for Iquitos is much less as compared to San Juan. Uh, the numbers are shown on the uh, on the left hand side where we see that uh, there has been an increase in the number of population in the population from the year 2000 to 2013 for Iquitos. But surprisingly, there has been a decline in the population uh, from uh, the year 2000 to 2013 for San Juan. We believe that it is possible that the people have started to move out in search for more opportunities and not specifically related to dengue as a specific uh, disease being spread so much. The second thing was exploring uh, uh, humidity value. As uh, I mentioned before, it had the highest correlation. So it was one of the things we wanted to look at. Uh, in the two plots that you see, the red line, the red dashed line always indicates the highest value. And the green line always indicates the lowest value in the whole uh, data that we looked at. As you can see that the uh, the humidity varies very widely across months, and but there's always a consistent pattern of it going up and down across a given year. Now, the humidity is higher in Equitos as compared to San Juan. We can see that it reaches to a value of above 95 in, in a majority of the years, uh, uh, but it only reaches to a value of 84 uh, for San Juan. Now, this gives us an insight that it might be possible that the humidity uh, uh, is one of the biggest case, uh, one of the biggest factors leading to a, sp a spread in dengue because they are very wide and leading to more number of uh, dengue cases in a given region. Similarly, we had uh, in, uh, we wanted to actually look at the air temperature as well because we identified that it's one of the key factors uh, uh, affecting dengue spread. So. As you can see, the air temperatures show much more variations in San Juan as compared to Puerto, uh, as compared to Equitos. You see that in 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 the upper plot, the uh, the density plots are much more uh, thicker in the middle, indicating the more information is concentrated there and then less elongated. But when we look at uh, San Juan, we see that the uh, that the values are much more elongated, indicating that the values range very widely across a given year. It ranging from a value of 294 to a value of 303 in the year 2005 itself and not being concentrated in at a certain value across the whole year. Now, uh, looking at it, it might appear that uh, uh, the year 2000 to 2013 appeared to be a bit outliers. There's a reasonable justification for that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are starting from July of 2000 and not the January of 2000. Hence, the data is not for the complete year and leading to, you know, a little deviation from what is expected from the general behavior. Similarly, for the year 2013, we see that the analysis ends on April 2013, uh, as far as we could uh, go. And as a result, for the remaining year, we don't have, we didn't have the data. So it's just uh, a little uh, out, it's, it's an outlier, which could be ignored when doing any further analysis. So this was the second aspect that we did. Now, when we completed this whole project and, uh, you know, uh, identified that these are the two things that we wanted to do, we created the whole application, uh, wrote a report, uh, wrote a very uh, uh, extensive paper around it. We found that uh, we had really short time, but we had hopes of what we wanted to do in the future and some things that we really wanted to improve upon. So we had few key improvements. First of them was improving the performance. I would say that we use the Folium library. It's one of the good libraries out there, but there are better libraries which are much more efficient. Folium actually regenerates the HTML document every time you request it, which means it has to resend and recreate the whole HTML document every time, causing a lot of latency and lag when we make an update. So we can use a better library there. We wanted to add some non-functional improvements. Someday the idea is that we'll publish this uh, project as a website that you can uh, go, just type in the URL and go there and start interacting with it. So that's why we want there to be a much more better user interaction. The, uh, so whenever you click on says the submit button, it shows you a loading sign that, hey, something is loading and something's going to turn up soon. And it does not implement uh, indicate that the application has hanged or there is some error. Lastly, we thought that uh, uh, we wanted to create our application uh, co compliant with the standards provided by the Americans in the uh, Disability Act. Something that I uh, recently learned about is really important because 
our audience is not just a limited number of people, but wide range of people. We wanted that the application is accessible through their keyboards and the colors match that everyone else can see. So for any future uh, uh, deploy, uh, development, we want to deploy this application online so it can be accessed anywhere. Uh, secondly, we want to add more and more data. We want the policymakers and the governments to see that this is actually creating some important information out there. We can create early warning system. We can create dengue. We can curb dengue spread. And once they realize that, they would really start collecting more data regarding their own cities and make it more publicly available so it can be in integrated with this app. And finally, the last aspect was to use uh, machine learning to make predictions of our own and actually create an early warning system as the next step. So with that, uh, that's the end of this short and big presentation. We uh, wrote a paper and we have the application code available through the uh, QR codes on the screen as well as the links. So if anyone has any more questions, I'm here to answer them now. Thank you. So I, I have, so thank you very much, Karn. Um, you left lots of room for good questions and discussion and debate and argument. <laughs> um, so just some, so this was a project that appears very heavy on the software engineering side. And there yeah. was a couple different things uh, from an architectural standpoint. Um, uh, like F Flask, I hear people talk about Flask a lot. Um, is Flask sort of a way to have a, a personal uh, application server or personal web server? What is Flask exactly? Okay, so Flask is like a local server. So it's basically used for development purposes. So okay. it allows you to like very, very quickly start up an application and uh, application server, and then you can start hosting your things on that. But it's only for Python, uh, as far as I know, it's only for Python. So if your whole code is in Python, your project is in Python, it can interact uh, with the HTML part of your application and provide the server functionality. So, so it's, it's, it's on it's, the local host, yes. So, so when you guys uh, deployed this, what did you deploy to? Did you just run it on your own machines? Did you uh, have an like an ITWS server that you stood it up on? What did you, how did you deploy this? Or how have you deployed this so far? Okay, so the first thing that we did was we uh, tested it on the local server, as I mentioned, using Flask. But uh, it's easy to deploy it on an AWS or other server. One of my teammates actually used I, as I've, uh, is uh, the AWS server, like the um, uh, sandbox, to put that Flask server there and then access it through a specific link. We had this link called dengue.com colon 5000, which was active during uh, the uh, length of the semester. But after that, uh, the, the student that created that uh, 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 link uh, actually graduated. So that link is actually no longer working. But we have uh, the, we are working, like the team is still working on actually publishing it on a specific website. Uh, we have two routes for that right now. I have my own website. I can simply add it to it, or we can reach out and uh, talk with departments at the at uh, Rensselaer, uh, uh, Rensselaer to you know publish it as an uh, one of the uh, URLs. Yeah, you you as you know from your work on the COVID side, there might be issues with that. <laughs> um, but I mean, but we could we could connect you, we could have a conversation with Bob and see what's possible. Um, and here's another question you, that you know is coming from a mile away. Um, no, before I get to that question. That would be great. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, thanks, uh, John. Uh, yeah, if you, can, uh, if you can connect with Bob, that would be great. And also, Pete Fox mentioned if it's possible, they could even uh, do it. Uh, um, maybe, uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work, uh, but uh, he said that Putting it up on the Atlas World demo page. I don't know how it is possible, but uh, he oh, just mentioned it. Yeah. Well, it's not as easy as Peter makes it sound, and it still ultimately goes through Bob. We 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 used to do things a long time ago through um, mm -hmm. through Atlas. We may or may not be able to do that, but it it may be possible because we've got a new. Um, I mean, this is a little inside baseball here, but we it. It may be possible on the new 
tetherless world, uh, virtual server host hypervisor, we may be able to stand up something there. So it, it may be possible to do it that way and that might actually be easier, but that's a, that's a possible route as well. That actually might make the, uh, the most sense uh, as a first approach. So, um, but I can help you shape that request. <laughs> that would be one, okay. that would be okay. great. Yes. So I had an, an so we, we saw, um, this is kind of a data, this is very heavy on the data exploration, sort mm -hmm. of visual, visualizing uh, with sort of prediction prediction in the future. Who, who are the core users that you anticipate for this? Who, who do you see as the people actually using this? Is it oh, well, policymakers okay. or, I mean, you mentioned that up front, but who do you expect looking at violin plots is kind of my question. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, uh, the idea was to like uh, create this application for researchers. The, okay. uh, as I said, like we have created the ground, we have the data, we created basic plots. We showed that some correlation exists using the correlation metrics. But the next step is actually to create an early warning system. While okay. we had limited time to create one, but we'd surely like to create one. And the uh, concept behind using those violin plots or using those line plots was that to show that there is some variation that exists between different cities leading to different uh, dengue, uh, number of dengue cases in the two cities so that it gives them uh, an understanding that this particular risk factor is, might be one of the things that they want to explore. Okay, no, that's that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's important to realize that this was uh, the first thing out the door and then there's subsequent work that can happen. But here's another question from an mm -hmm. implementation standpoint. Uh, why not R? <laughs> okay, so that's, yeah, a, that's, that's a, good, a question. Good you knew what was coming. <laughs> okay, so I, I saw that coming. Though, so the the idea was that the team was more comfortable in Python, uh, to be honest, and there was no specific reason, uh, uh, other reason why we didn't choose R. Uh, uh, we we didn't choose R over Python. Uh, uh, as far as I can tell, like uh, uh, I was very, pro I, I am proficient. I would say proficient in both Python and R now, so I can work with both of them. But the team collectively decided that Python was something that everybody knew, and it was easy for get uh, for us to get it started with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but but, uh, well, but yeah, I, I guess you know. So the, it's important, you know, when when you consider it. You're you're talking about like an end-to-end -end system, uh, including be able to, being able to stand it up as an application, and and um, and one of the things, as you know from from our work on the other side, uh, it's it's pretty straightforward to be able to go all the way through, uh, and it's and you you were able to build kind of an end-to-end -end thing using. Uh, Python, but integrating different things together. And I, I also noted, oh, I, the, yeah, the, the, that actually touched on it. So can you clarify what the role of Jupyter Notebooks was in this? Did you actually use Jupyter Notebooks as part of your application development or more as like a prototyping environment? How did you use Jupyter Notebooks? So the Jupyter Notebooks were used to, you know, first of all, do all the data cleaning that we did, we removed all the outliers, we combined all the data and everything. I use Jupyter Notebooks because, you know, I could list down everything and the reason why I did them. Because someday, someday in the future, we did it monthly, but someone would say like, hey, I want to do weekly. So they know exactly why we did something. And if they want to change, they can make the direct changes. So that's what the first thing that Jupyter Notebooks were used okay. for. Yeah. The that second was sense. the plots that we see in the end, all the violin plots and all the line plots, they were all created in the Jupyter Notebook. With proper explanation. Okay, no, that's excellent. That's 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 a great mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, other questions. Thilanka, you probably don't have any because <laughs> you already asked all your questions. Yeah, I, I asked those oh. questions uh, during the class time and uh, when they were writing the paper as well. So, I am all good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Car, did you have any questions? Um, I guess 
why did you choose to use violin plots? My, I mean, I don't know much, but like when I saw people like use them or like I heard of them, I thought that they were like kind of like more of like a fun thing that somebody created. I didn't know that like, yeah, I don't know. Just like, why did you choose that over maybe something else? So, so you switch back to them and kind of explain yeah. what they're showing because they, they're kind of a hybrid in what they show. Can you bring up that slide and kind of talk through exactly what they're showing? Okay, so uh, Kara, a very good question. Uh, so another alternative to this is usually the uh, box plots, but the idea of using a violin plots is like it's twofold. Uh, the if you see uh, very closely the black line in the middle, right? So this actually acts like the complete box plot in itself. It has a median value. It has the first quartile, third quartile, and the whole range of data. And on the second time, it uh, when you see the if if you look at the second two thousand one, the orange background uh, orange uh, actually shows the density of the values, giving us an insight into where the most information was concentrated and not just what the quartiles value values were. So that's why it's like a better way to uh, use it here. But as I mentioned, like a box plot is another way, but it gives a little less information than a violent plot. So it's a density plot as well as providing uh, the statistical distribution information. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kara, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And here what it, it does nicely, because you've, you've, got, you've got the two different locations uh, you see, as as Karn said during his presentation, you you've got a uh, in San Juan, you've got a, like a much wider, you know, the, the it's kind of uh, that air temperature is kind of distributed. Um, you don't ha simply have a big range, but it's kind of evenly distributed over that range. Whereas in the um, uh, is it Equitos? Yeah, Equitos. Um, yeah. It's kind of lumpier. <laughs> it's it's more it's more kind of lumped in the the middle there, which is also kind of shown in the box plot. You can kind of interpret it that way, but um, but it's it's kind of dramatically highlights that. Yeah. I've used uh, box plots to kind of dramatically show the interaction of. Uh, Star Wars characters. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, other questions, Richard? Did you have any questions for Karn? I was curious about the violin plots, but those were just explained. Uh, that was it. Uh, other than that, I'm happy okay. to just be a spectator. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, why don't we? Uh, Thank Karen. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. We have, we have another talk uh, next week. Uh, watch your watch your emails, everybody. Thank you for joining this evening. Um, and uh, actually, we've got uh, talks both from Idea and uh, Tethos World over the next few weeks. So have a great evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.